We're not here today to bash someone else's mother. No, no. Our hope is to point to the beauty of our mother. There's no godliness except from God. Mm. The non Castedonian church specifically was to say, hold on, we're uncomfortable with this. Mm. Disregarding that or talking about anything with that being not foundational is, is the epitome of absurdity. Mm. Mm. Please don't do that. Don't tell somebody what they believe. Mm. If you want to know what a group of believers genuinely believe, ask them. Because like, like Father Anthony mentioned, what we do see is we do see saints and they're, they're virtuous saints and the depth and the richness is there. There's been a beautiful dialogue that has been taking place, but challenges remain. Mm -hmm. When someone insults your mother, most people get angry. The inclination is to want to give a response to defend your mother, to get her honor and her dignity, to protect her. In some way thinking that in vindicating your mother by tearing the other mother down, you've accomplished something positive. We're not going to be taking that approach in today's podcast. By our mother, I'm speaking generally about the Oriental Orthodox churches and more specifically about the Coptic Orthodox Church. And by the other mother, I'm talking about the Eastern Orthodox churches. Recently, Father John Mahfouz of St. Matthew Orthodox Christian Church in Torrance, California, participated in a podcast interview entitled Eastern and Oriental Orthodoxy, What is the Difference? The tone was, let's say, less than charitable, and included numerous points that did not properly re represent the Coptic Orthodox Church and her faith. This is not a reflection of the entire body. We have fathers, brothers, and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox Church who certainly do not take that tone. You will notice that Father John Mahfouz continually refers to Eastern Orthodox Christians as the Orthodox Church and us as either Coptics or Oriental, what they call Oriental Orthodox. This is quite different than the spirit and tone taken by scholars, theologians, and hierarchs in the Eastern Orthodox Church, including people like Dr. Peter Butniff, Father Chad Hatfield, Father John McGuckin, Christine Sheo, Father John Baer, Andrew Luth, and countless others. These are people who have deeply researched this topic and have remained intentional at being in dialogue with the Oriental Orthodox. We're not here today to bash someone else's mother. No, no. Our hope is to point to the beauty of our mother, to clarify who she is and what sort of life she has taught us, a life of holiness, piety, and charity that's based on the truth that we have received 2,000 years ago and sought to faithfully preserve throughout the centuries. To be clear, I had a very honest and loving conversation about a week and a half ago with Father John Mahfouz. I shared with him many of my concerns and topics that we're going to be discussing today. I invited him to participate in today's podcast to represent his own voice and to clarify, but for various reasons, he was unable to participate. We had a very charitable and loving conversation and agreed that we would continue to remain in touch. My hope is that today's conversation will simply clarify and point to how brothers can respond to one another in love. For today's discussion, I'd like to turn it over to our uh, panelists, people that you all know quite well, uh, Father Gabriel Wisa, Father Anthony Murad, and Father Carolus Murad. Uh, Y'all are old friends and brothers, and just glad we could get together and discuss uh, this topic today. Thanks, Likewise, Father. Father. We're happy to be with you, Father. Mm -hmm. So, so we're going to be talking about some of the differences between these two mothers or the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox churches. I want to start off with a segment from uh, Father John Mahfouz, and uh, I'd love to get some reaction uh, from you. What are some of the differences and why do they exist? 
there's a difference. And as pious and wonderful as they are, and, and, and how inspiring for, for many people, the, the Coptic church is not the church. And so, so that, that, that um, you know, question left me of whether I should become Coptic or not. And really more and more became clear to me as I was younger, the Orthodox Church is the church established by Christ with all the richness of faith, all the depth of faith, and all the medicine that a human being needs to be healed. That saves us. It has Christ. All right, so what are some of the differences that exist between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox Church? Are they substantive? Are they... So I think when comparing the two families, it's important to note that um, this question is not suddenly a new question. This is something that historically has been studied for a, 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 an extensive amount of time. And usually uh, it's important for us to understand that when dialoguing about this kind of question, both families would actually produce some of the best scholars and theologians that they have in order to be able to create this form of ecumenical dialogue. And if you just take a look at the amount of dialogue that has happened in the 20th century, when we presented the best that we have in order to have these conversations, they have come to the conclusion that the similarities between us at the level of the most important aspects of the faith cannot possibly be denied. And so the reality is, we ought to, based on the conversations that we have had, the way that we look at each other today, we ought to recognize in each other that we are both churches that are filled with grace. The presence of the Holy Spirit is very clearly at work in both of our churches. Does this necessarily mean, and does it have to translate into, that there is uniformity between us? Absolutely not. We, we don't have to have uniformity in order for us to have unity. If you take a look at the early church, that didn't exist. The Church of Jerusalem was not necessarily exactly uniform to the Church of Alexandria, to the Church of Rome, and so on and so forth. We can have unity without the need for everyone to express themselves in the exact same way at all times. But on the things that matter, these things that are dogmatic, that are non-negotiable, it is very clear through the extensive amount of effort and prayer that has been put in in the 20th century, that very clearly we, there is an extensive amount of similarity that, again, cannot and should not be denied. So with all due respect to Father John, when he says the Orthodox Church, and here he's pointing strictly to the Eastern Orthodox Church, that only the Eastern Orthodox Church is the church, then he's also implying that everyone who is not part of the Eastern Orthodox is outside of the church. And we also know that the teachings of the Holy Church are very clear. If you are outside of the church, you are outside of the body. But what does that imply? at the level of how it is that you see us when it comes to our possibility for communion with God, our possibility to be able to produce saints, to have a church that is filled with grace, to have a church where the priesthood of Christ is very clearly at work. All of these things are left vague and open in the way that Father John speaks. But I really do think that if you take a look at both the scholars on the Eastern side, and the theologians on the, the Oriental side and all of the conversations that they have had, mm -hmm. most would agree that while we do have some differences, those differences do not in any way render us or put us in a place where we can look at the other and say, we do not recognize your face. That, that, that the ethos that exists in both churches, the similarities, the spirit that clearly guides both of these churches is one and the same. And so to suggest that somehow our differences must then translate, that we have to remain divided, I would strongly disagree with Father John Mahfouz. So, so what are the differences that he's talking about? I don't understand. So he, he mentions that, that there's in the Eastern Orthodox there's healing. He mentions that there's a fullness. So, so how is it that this is not present in the Oriental Orthodox churches? I don't understand. Because like, like Father Anthony mentioned, what we do see is we do see saints and they're, they're virtuous saints and the depth and the richness is there. So, I mean, for me not to be able to see this in the Oriental Orthodox churches, I have to be, forgive me, um, 
don't want to say in, in denial, or I, I, I'm not interacting with that church enough. I'm not uh, in the midst of that church. I'm not able to 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 have my, my eyes and, and my senses open to what's actually happening there. Because if you actually look at what's happening in the Orthodox churches, the Coptic Orthodox churches, like Father Anthony said, full of saints, full of youth, virtue is there, obedience, we find humility. Can we Can we have saints outside of the body of Christ? Right. That's a good question. That's a good question. And by implication, if you're saying they're outside of the church, you're also implying they're graceless. And yeah. if they're graceless, how can they produce saints? And so th this is, I think, the big problem with a short video where many things are said. And I think Father John, um, maybe even inadvertently, because I can't speak to his intention, um, but it is, it is clear that he falls into that trap of what is implied, then suggests that <laughs> we're outside of the body mm -hmm. of Christ. Which is definitely not the reality of what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think, Father, you said something in the very beginning. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that there are differences, especially at the level of our expressions. Mm -hmm. There's also the fact that historically, we have to confess the fact that in the fifth century, uh, we went in separate ways. There was multiple attempts of reconciliation on both sides. We did not want to be divided. We were hoping mm. to be reunited through the Holy Spirit. But then eventually, especially in the Coptic Orthodox Church, um, at some point, the church was preoccupied no longer with dialogue, but survival. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And historically, especially if you take a look at what happens in uh, the 7th and 8th century, eventually the church went on a different path, was not communicating with anyone, and was very focused strictly at the level of making sure that there was a church in Egypt mm. that would survive many different things. Ultimately, uh, while we no longer spoke for a certain while, there's absolutely no doubt mm. that we walked parallel and as faithfully as possible to what it is that we received. So there, there has to be differences in expression. We didn't live the same challenges necessarily. But what we did live was still very much guided by the Holy Spirit. So I think the differences that we might have might very well be at the level of our expressions, but they are definitely not at the level of the foundation of our faith. It's interesting because as a, as a young man, when I was finding my way back to Christ in the church, one of the things that, that really struck me was when I visited different churches, uh, Oriental, Orthodox and non, uh, I was really struck because I, I was not familiar as a young man with the Eastern Orthodox Church. I didn't know anything about um, Christians really outside of the Coptic Orthodox Church, with the exception of you know Catholics and Protestants and whatnot. But but I think what really struck me is when I came to experience the Eastern Orthodox churches that we were kind of in this 1,500-year breakup with. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking and I'm like, there's a lot of parallels and similarities that are there. Yes, there's some difference of expression, but for me, that was really comforting because I thought to myself, if our church, which has been kind of broken up with them for 1,500 years, is so much closer than they are with the Catholic church, right, and even more so than with the, the Protestant churches, to me, that was really comforting and encouraging that, wait, we've both really sought to preserve that which we received during the apostolic and patristic era um, and, and to live that, right? And so, yeah, some of those differences are there. I do think they're mostly expression. Mm -hmm. um, Can you clarify that? What, what is meant by expression? Yeah, so, so, so liturgical vestments certainly. Mm. Uh, hymnology, uh, some of the liturgical language that we use, uh, even some of the ecclesial structure with, you know, in the Eastern Orthodox they, uh, church, they all kind of fall under the ecumenical patriarch, more or less, up until recently. But <laughs> um, whereas I think in the Oriental Orthodox uh, churches, we have this sense of first among equals within our own communion, communion but not over one another. Mm -hmm. And so there's some diversity, I think, that exists there. I think one other point that you hinted at very briefly in the Oriental family, we're a lot more comfortable with diversity. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think in the Eastern Orthodox Church, there was a lot of effort 
um, in making sure that part of that unity that they wanted among them also translated into uniformity. Mm. Whereas in the Oriental Church, um, <laughs> it, it's it's very interesting. We we might share the same altar and pray a liturgy with each other and not necessarily know even the structure mm -hmm. of what the other member of this same family is going to be praying. And yet, we have absolutely no doubt that despite this being something that is different from the expression I am used to, there is absolutely no need to call that division. Difference doesn't necessarily have to, have to translate into division the same way that, again, unity doesn't have to translate into mm -hmm. uniformity. I think we're much more comfortable with that, but that even that is an expression of the experience that we have lived um, as a church, mm -hmm. specifically the Coptic Orthodox Church, uh, as a church that was cut off, focusing on dealing with persecution and attempted to keep our spirituality as alive as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's a very Trinitarian theology, right? That this is beautiful mm -hmm. that there's diversity, yet that there is unity. It's something yeah. that we should we should look for. We should not impose ourselves on the Eritreans, the Ethiopians, you know, uh, the Indians, like. Right, so so it's it's a beautiful thing. So I do not want uh, the listeners to to understand or to see this diversity as something that is negative, like Father Anthony is implying. It's beautiful and it's deeply rooted in our theology, and it's something that we should embrace. Let the person express himself as he or she needs in the liturgy, based on their culture, as long as their dogma and theology is accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dogma and theology being brought up. Uh, Father John, in the segment uh, that was played, he talks about the piety of the uh, of the Copts. And the word piety is uh, the word godliness. Mm -hmm. You know, this great mystery of piety, it's this great mystery of godliness. Mm -hmm. That paragraph that mm. the Egyptian church puts in St. Basil's liturgy, at the beginning of the institution narrative, mm. this great mystery of godliness for being determined to give himself up for the life of the world. And there's no godliness except from God. Mm. Amen. Well said. Yeah. If there are youth till this day who are still worshiping the crucified God man, um, it's because there is grace being mm. poured forth from the um, fearful and divine mysteries mm. uh, that is feeding us life, mm. life which heals our problem, which is death. Mm. So to say that there's no healing, mm. to be able to pronounce on the divine mysteries that there is no life being poured forth, that there is no, that there's no healing there. Um, one would have to substantiate said claim a bit more in detail. It can't be um, en passant, as mm -hmm. they say, yeah, in, in yeah. passing. Yeah. Father Anthony, you mentioned that there are numerous scholars, theologians from both the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox that have been discussing this topic for many decades. And so I'd like to turn just to a short segment by Christine Cheo, who has been uh, at the forefront of this. And in fact, she was in the halls of that first, uh, or one of the first uh, ecumenical gatherings in Switzerland, I believe it was. And so I, she's gonna speak a little bit here about the differences. Are they truly theological or purely semantics, as some people might say? Uh, and love your reactions to her video. So are there differences that are truly theological or is this, as some have said, uh, no, it's really just a matter of semantics? Well, I would say that semantics implies vocabulary and words which played a role for the theological terminology produced at Chalcedon. At Chalcedon, to speak of Christ being God as well as man, they used a new terminology speaking of two natures, in Greek, two physeis. This new terminology was not accepted by people who feared that, that this would imply a separation of the divinity and humanity in Christ. At Chalcedon, they also said that these two natures were in one person, 
which prevents any idea of separation. This is why it is so important, even today, that the Eastern Orthodox or Chalcedonians would also say and, and repeat that they believe in two natures, not only that in two natures, but in one person in Christ. Otherwise, we can perpetuate the misunderstanding if we, if we speak only of two natures. As for, non, as for the non-Chalcedonians, they wanted to remain faithful to Cyril of Alexandria, whose formula in Greek is mia physis to theu logu sesarkomeni, meaning one physis, and I like to keep this word physis, so I repeat, one physis incarnate of God the Word. And here you can understand that when you speak of God the Word, you speak of the divinity of Christ, and when you speak of in, when you say incarnate, you speak of the humanity of Christ. So you have to understand properly this formula. But this formulation, miaphysis, was wrongly understood as monophysis, mm. which makes a huge difference. Miaphysis should be understood as a composite nature including divinity and humanity in Christ. And uh, of course, uh, these two formulations should be given with all their words, as I said before, and not cut, uh, keeping only the words mia physis or two natures. Otherwise, uh, they will be misinterpreted. Thus, both formulations of Cyril and of Chalcedon can be accepted if they are well understood and explained. This was said and done during the unofficial and official bilateral dialogues. What is essential in the dialogue today is to understand that Saint Cyril is also a church father for the Chalcedonians as his name is present in the Synaxarium, that is the book of the lives of the saints. And his writings are studied in the Eastern Orthodox faculties and quoted by Orthodox theologians until today. On the other side, the four adverbs used at Chalcedon, that is, without confusion, without change, without separation, and without division, these four adverbs balance and clarify everything. And they can also be found in liturgical and other texts of the non-Chalcedonian churches. All these elements prevent from lapsing into Ill illegitimate extremes and are a common ground for reconciliation. So, your thoughts on what Christine uh, Cheo just shared, and also if you could help us to understand the terms um, monophysitism, eophysitism, diaphysitism, and others. I'd like to share a story that Father George Dragas shared with us in class once. We're and Father George, just for the listening audience, is? Father George Dragas is a, a proto-presbyter, an archpriest, in the Greek Orthodox Church. Okay. And if memory serves correctly, he's still in the United States. Yes, yes. He I is. think he teaches now a class in the Coptic Seminary in L.A. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that would be... Yeah. in keeping with yeah. who Father George is yeah. in terms of his of his love. Um, Father George was giving us a class uh, in ecclesiology at uh, uh, the Orthodox uh, study, which was, uh, it was a program that was run by the Eastern Orthodox. It was an Eastern Orthodox program. And speaking about the beginnings of the dialogues that uh, Madame Christine Chaillot is referencing, he says that we went to the WCC with zero hope. Hmm. 
He's speaking of himself and Father John Romanides, another priest from from the Greek Orthodox communion. And uh, they had no hope. It was uh, it was uh, it was one of these things where uh, we're all gonna pretend to be nice together, say a few things diplomatic, and go back. Kumbaya, and, kumbaya, <laughs> exactly. Well what, is, what is WCC? The World Council of Churches. Sorry. Mm. And uh, he says we were awestruck. If um, I'm, you know, I'm very loosely paraphrasing here. Mm -hmm. You know, just from memory. But he goes, we were in shock when we discovered uh, these people who, and these, by these people he means uh, us. The Oriental. The, yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah. Um, the Orthodox tradition of the three councils, <laughs> however you want to put it. Uh, he was, we were, you, what do you mean? You don't, you, you, you don't honor Eutyches? Hmm. You don't, you don't, uh, you, you don't believe that Christ is, uh, a divinity, uh, a, a divine nature that swallowed up the humanity. Uh, uh, you believe he is fully human and fully divine. And when we started, and then this and this uh, took on b bigger, bigger uh, uh, ramifications, larger ramifications, when they started talking about the shape of the liturgy mm -hmm. and the fasting and how and 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 the asceticism of the church and especially father john romanidis was very 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 intrigued by the fact that our tradition kept alive noetic prayer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the tradition of noetic prayer and uh and this and this caused everything to explode for them in terms of looking things up telling other people they were very very excited mm -hmm. uh because there was a he what he said he, he didn't say a shared experience he said we could smell the likeness in each other and uh, that's beautiful i just wanted to add that to the you know as a reaction of some things that mm -hmm. madame chaillot had uh, had mentioned well, we're gonna catch a clip in a little bit um i don't remember if it was madame Shayo or uh dr butnif but one of the two of them said you know we we went to the wcc and um we've entered into these dialogues and now we've come back to our churches and the response was like, uh Oh, what do we do now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we're well, actually, we weren't ready for yeah. this. Yeah. 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 And it's so refreshing. It's so refreshing to see those people that are open-minded, that are humble, you know, seeking unity because it's the only right thing to do again, based on proper theology. Um, and I mean, I mean, the one thing that 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 is uh, of great importance for me is is the idea of the fifth council that the Eastern Orthodox have, and, and you know, like Canon Eight, and, and that comes from that council that that clearly speaks about Miaphysis as being an acceptable expression in terms right. of Christology. And if we know anything about church um, hierarchy or, or or authority, we know that the councils especially ecumenical ones are the ones that hold the uh, heaviest weight right so so from their perspective having this as an ecumenical council that says this and it's right there that's what you believe in yet at the same time you claim that this expression is incorrect be and because we don't say it the same way you say it mm. um i don't know on, on, honestly it's a, it's a head scratcher for me but again, I'm so happy and I'm so refreshed by people like Christine Chaillot. May God keep her, and I hope that others adopt that type of behavior. So, so for the for the sake of the listener, can we distinguish between the terms? Yeah, because for for some folks, this might be unfamiliar territory for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, when when we speak about um, a person who is monophysite or has fallen into the heresy of monophysitism, we're basically referencing Eutyches. Eutyches, who was an archmanid right in Constantinople and who made the mistake of assuming that what happened in Christ is that the divinity, when it came into the presence of the humanity of Christ, basically swallowed it up because the humanity could not stand in the presence of the divinity and somehow that translated into... Um, it swallowed it up, it assumed it, and now there is only one real nature in the person of Jesus Christ. And to be clear, 
both families, Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian, condemn monophysitism. Mm. Um, in light of that, the and Eutychus. Absolutely, and Eutychus is seen as a heretic, mm -hmm. and even an arch heretic, uh, because of the introduction of this very specific heresy. Now, some people, and I think again, Father John makes the mistake of implying implicitly, accusing us of basically saying, "Okay, they're gonna they're gonna say they're not monophysite; they're actually miaphysite." In reality, it's gonna sound like we're all the same, but we're really not. So. I would just want to deviate from the conversation for just a second, and I would encourage everyone who's listening, please don't do that. Don't tell somebody what they believe. Mm. If you want to know what a group of believers genuinely believe, ask them. Don't sit there and tell them what they believe. Like Father just gave a beautiful example of how it is that um, Father George Dragas and Father Romanides, when they went there and actually dialogued and asked, hold on. You genuinely believe this? Can you explain? They were shocked at what they heard. Mm. But there is this unfortunate reality that exists where people already have um, a preconditioned idea of what it is that the other family believes. And in so doing, they condemn them without ever dialoguing with them. Open our books. See for yourself our, in, our, our, our understanding uh, of what the liturgy is, or what our Christology is, how it is that we build our Christology on the forefather who defended the faith in Ephesus, St. Cyril of Alexandria. Miaphysis was not a term that we created when our backs were up against the wall in Chalcedon. This is the terminology that was handed down to us in Alexandria. Remember, the Coptic Orthodox Church is Alexandrian. We are the children of Cyril. And when we receive this teaching, we maintained it as faithfully as we possibly could. So what does it mean to say that we are miaphysite and not monophysite. And, and Father, please uh, jump in here because I know you're going to be able to express this better than I can. But St. Cyril, the way he explains it very clearly is there is both the Godhead and humanity, very clearly, both natures, in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they are united in a way that is ineffable, completely mysterious, and unseparable. And so because in him they are one, he then describes this as mia feces. He is not suggesting that one swallowed the other. There is no such thing. There is no mingling. There is no confusion. There is no alterations. And we continue to use that terminology every single liturgy we pray. So daily, the Coptic Orthodox Church confesses that we believe that his humanity was united to his divinity without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration. This is drastically different from the heresy of, um, of Eutyches. And again, if we go back to Constantinople II, that fifth ecumenical council, which we did not participate in, that terminology was both approved and accepted and seen as a, a very acceptable expression of our understanding of Christology. Does that, that make sense? Really? Sure. We just need seven more podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to unpack, for sure. There's a lot to unpack. And since there. Cyril was, the, was continually declared as a saint in that council, right? His 12 chapters were upheld. His 12 anathemas were upheld. And it's all there in the canons. I and mean, so he's a common father. So we are all his children, actually, although he's a patriarch from Alexandria, right? We are all his children. So what are we talking about? What are we talking about? The word Mia in the Gospel of St. Matthew is used by the evangelist when the Lord is speaking about the two shall become one. One. Mm. You just reminded me. When he speaks about one, the Greek word there is Mia. It's not monos. Mm. It's not mono. Um, so it's a, but it's a real unity. What we, what we believe about when two people walk into church to be married, to be wed, to be crowned, mm -hmm. they walk out mystically, truly, one. Mm. And that the unity is real. So if we speak mm. about a unity, that's where the word comes from, UN, right? Mm. The, the UN there is is for, you know, is uh, where most languages speak about one. It will be EN in Greek, enosis, unity. That means that the, the reality is that they are one. We have no problem speaking of the two 
pragmas, the two things, the two, the two of which Christ is, mm. of which Christ is. But we, but, but we speak of one Lord, Jesus Christ, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the yeah. Virgin Mary, and became man. Mm. When I, in, in light of what you just said, um, I want to read a passage from St. Cyril. Um, and this is taken directly from his writings on the unity of Christ. And I absolutely love this very specific writing because the way that he that he writes it, it's really beautiful how it is that there's somebody who's posing a question and then he's mm. giving the answer and he's anticipating the rebuttal and he's it's, it's so wonderfully done. Mm -hmm. um, but right before you begin, can I just comment about the title of the work? Yeah. And, and the, the Greek is Peri Is O Christos, that Christ is one. On mm. the fact that, peri, mm. peri, you know, on the, uh, around the, <laughs> the fact that Christ mm. is one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to hear from you and then I want us to play a, sh a clip because I think Dr. Peter Butinov speaks and gives a very thoughtful response to this question as well. And I'd like to get your reflections on that after. Sure. Yep. After okay, so, so I'm going to read directly from, um, from St. Cyril of Alexandria. So he says, Godhead is one thing, manhood quite another. So what are these things which we say have come into unification? One cannot speak of things united when there's only one thing to start with. Mm -hmm. There must be two or more. Clearly demonstrating that, of course, there is Godhead and of course there is manhood. So the person who's asking the question says, this is why they argue that these things we name are separate realities. St. Cyril responds, but they are not separated, as I have already said, in terms of individual distinctness, so that they exist apart and distant from one another. On the contrary, they are brought together into an indissoluble union. For as John says, the word became flesh. The person posing the question says, in that case, both natures must have been confused and have become one. St. Cyril responds, but who would be so misguided and stupid as to think that the divine nature of the word had changed into something which formerly it was not, or that the flesh was changed by some kind of transformation into the nature of the word himself? This is impossible. We say that there is one son and that he has one nature, even when he is considered as having assumed flesh endowed with a rational soul. As I have already said, he has made the human element his own. And this is the way, not otherwise, that we must consider that the same one is at once God and man. The person posing the question says, then he does not have two natures, that of God and that of man? St. Cyril responds, well, Godhead is one thing and manhood is another thing, considered in the perspective of the respective and intrinsic beings. But in the case of Christ, they came together in a mysterious and incomprehensible union without confusion or change. The manner of this union is entirely beyond conception. Mm. To us, this is our understanding of what it means to be Miaphysite. Mm. Can we give some uh, philosophical background to sure. what St. Cyril is saying here? Yeah. When he, when he calls out that whoever would think that there could be mixture is foolish and or, in the words of St. Cyril, stupid, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, the basic teaching uh, philosophically behind all of that is that things of different natures, if they unite, they do not cause mixture. That is to say, when he likens Interesting. when he likens the unity of soul and body in a human being mm -hmm. because the soul is of a nature of a certain nature and the body is of another nature them coming together and uniting don't make mm. mixture the soul mm -hmm. does not stop becoming soul and the body does not stop becoming body the same way in which if i die a fabric a die is of a nature and a fabric is another if I bring them together and unite them, then if I now have a red shirt, it did not stop being a shirt. The <laughs> shirt is still, the physicality is still manipulable mm. the same way, but because of the difference of natures that come together into one, 
there is no mixture and you know the 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 the, the basic accusation is all oh, well you know in in you're saying one nature you're creating you're creating like a demigod or you know going mm. back into the pagan days mm, uh, that's monophysite. a tertium quid a, a mm. third something a yeah. third a, a third thing and that's absolute mm. foolishness and no one is speaking of any mixture or confusion there excellent thank you that this next uh, clip, it's it's a little bit of a longer one. It's about four minutes. I just admittedly usually watch my videos on double speed. So, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we'll watch it on normal speed right I now. I envy those who are able to do that. Yeah. But, <laughs> All right. Let's uh, take a look. Well, we referenced some terminology earlier, and I think this would be a good time for us to learn uh, from you and your research uh, how to understand the differences between a monophysite or monophysite, a neophysite, and then uh, kind of related, uh, but a few hundred, couple hundred years later, neophyletism. Can you help us with those terms? Sure. Uh I'll just briefly talk about the last one. Monothelitism was a uh, sixth, seventh century heresy that taught that Christ had only one will. And uh, so uh, one of the things, by the way, that the modern dialogue showed us, the, the 20th century dialogue, was that the Oriental churches have no problem confessing that Christ has both a human and a divine will, two wills, you know. So uh, that was one of the uh, joys of the of the modern dialogue is to say, oh, you also believe that there are two wills. Oh, you also believe that uh, Christ is consubstantial both with God the Father and with us as son of Mary, as son of the Father. Um, uh, oh, you also anathematize uh, Eutyches, uh, who, who, who taught that Christ's human nature was swallowed up by the divine. Oh, you know, this is a great discovery. So um, monophysite for centuries was kind of the going term to describe a very broad swath of, uh, of, of those who taught that Christ had one nature. Uh, the problem with the term monophysite is that it could describe um, heretics like Eutyches, uh, you might call it Eutychian monophysitism, or you could call it radical monophysitism, uh, who basically taught that Christ had no humanity at all, no human nature at all. Uh, but then uh, monophysites used to also describe what you might call moderate monophysites, Severian monophysites, etc., who taught that Christ was absolutely one with God and one with us. He has full humanity. Um, this is why he can say things like, I thirst, I hunger, um, ask where Lazarus is laid, etc. Meophysite now comes into play as, as a much more accurate term to describe the non-heretical monophysites. Why meophysite? Well, because it follows St. Cyril of Alexandria's formula. St. Cyril was a miaphysite. <laughs> he taught miaphysis to theologus es sarcomeni, one nature of God, the Word incarnate. Uh, that one nature is a divino human nature. Uh, it, uh, it, it is both divine and human, right? So it's, it's a way of maintaining the integrity and, and, uh, singularity of Christ's person. He is one person uh, who is both divine and human. That's his nature, to be both God and man. You know, So that's how Cyril of Alexandria, our common saint, expresses it, miaphysis. So miaphysite is a more accurate term, and it also makes it less likely for people to just, with a very broad stroke, say, oh, monophysite heretics. You know, it's very common. Uh, approach today among people who like to use the word heretic. Uh, the monophysites are all heretics, and with that broad stroke, they have eliminated, you know, fully Cyriline Christians, neophysite mm -hmm. Christians. So let's, uh, you know, the, the movement now is to say, let's use our terms carefully, like the fathers did, 
and say miaphysite to refer to the Oriental Orthodox who teach with Cyril one nature and use the word monophysite to speak of Eutyches and uh, the heresy of, uh, of that heresy. So let's use our terms carefully. Let's use our terms carefully. Uh, any thoughts on uh, that clip from Dr. Butenev? I'm just going to share a general thought for the audience. I mean, you can appreciate the meat and the information that someone of this caliber is actually providing. And you can clearly see the type of research and how meticulous he is. And, and, and if you compare that with others, like the other videos where nothing is being said other than, forgive me for the word, but polemics that are being thrown out at us, um, I think, you know, these two videos, if you contrast them, they speak for themselves. Um, and again, I'm very refreshed by seeing people like this from the Eastern Orthodox side. Mm. It takes a lot. I think it takes a lot of courage to yeah. say what Dr. Butnev said. Mm. There's an issue of narrative in what we're talking about, on the subject we're talking about. When both sides are saying that the father of their Christology, ultimately, is Saint Cyril. And then Dr. Butnev says what he just said. Mm -hmm. That that Saint Cyril is a, a Miaphysite. Yeah. When Saint Cyril speaks about the unity in the Greek, in his Greek, he says that it happened kataphysin, according to nature. That is to say, it was a natural union. But the unity that happen I mean, think about it it's a it's a natural union it's a um, that he united naturally <laughs> mm. to to humanity him being the word born bef from the father before all ages and and to say that it, you know if if we go about it historically that saint cyril brings about most of what he says from saint gregory the theologian you know, we know that we know that Saint Gregory the Theologian composed ten very elaborate anathemas in Constantinople in 381, mm -hmm. in defending, especially in defending the title Theotokos. You know, and there's a whole bunch of history that we can get into there. That we probably won't get into today, but that he that that Saint Cyril develops the twelve anathemas mm. uh, to finalize things, <laughs> um, and that they are read and proclaimed as the final um the final say in ephesus in 431 um and i think it's important to highlight that he takes these 12 anathemas from a lot of the content in the 12, in the 10 anathemas of saint gregory the theologian mm. right um who wasn't in alexandria <laughs> right <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. um and that these are put forth as the standard When things are said in council, in council, I say in council because we take very importantly what is said in council, mm -hmm. right? Uh, our church is a church of councils. Mm -hmm. We, but by, by, by saying that we are the church of the three councils, we say that we said what we have said about, about the faith, in the first and second council, as mm -hmm. they are, as they are, um, uh, I don't want to say the word enforced. I'm looking for a word here. As they are reconfirmed, reaffirmed in the third council mm -hmm. of 431 um, about the Trinity, about the incarnation, about the mystery of the incarnation, about the person of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, this is a very long way of saying the following. In remaining, in remaining, in remaining um, uh, absolutely, um, I don't want, I don't mean this negatively, but in remaining inflexible mm. 
to the ramifications of the of these 12 anathemas and in disagreeing with anyone who would say something like uh, for for example about the 12th anathema that he who hangs on the cross is god mm. right he who that he who hangs on the cross bodily is god his identity is god in this case the second person of the trinity when when a person um is is declared to be orthodox despite having said that the one who hangs on the cross is not the giver of life we take issue a very serious issue mm. in the words of father john mahfouz that is a problem mm -hmm. yeah for the sake of our audience can you just clarify who spoke that theodoret of cyrus who is who is someone who was declared heretic in the council of 449 mm -hmm. um not a council that we say is that we hold as ecumenical mm. right this is popularly referred to as the robber council latrocinium yeah the, the, the yep. robbers council yep. uh, a term coined by uh, the uh, the archbishop of rome mm. leo mm -hmm. uh after the fact yeah Right. Uh, that council, Theodoret of Cyrus, is deemed heretical, and the Roman legate at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, two years after, it's in the minutes, and we don't have any minutes for Chalcedon. The minutes that we have are from those who adhere to the Chalcedonian tradition. That's right. Right. Um, the Roman legates sent by Pope Leo um, say we have read it and found it to be orthodox. We have read his works on Christology and found them to be orthodox. Mm. We take issue with this. Mm. Uh, yeah, how are we supposed to react to this as, as Oriental Orthodox when mm. the um, the Christological formula is being changed. Uh, there's a Nestorian background to things, right? Mm -hmm. In the previous councils, um, we start hearing of two natures. Okay, it's it, it's in one person, but then Theodoret becomes comes in the picture. Ibes of Edessa comes in the picture, and these were people that had at the time, at least, and still to today, I think it is very uh, clear. Well, it is upheld by many that they had Nestorian implications in their teachings. Um, and even again in the Fifth Council, um, one of his documents um, was completely rejected, right? And I think it is part of the canons of that council. Um, so how are we supposed to feel? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I find that it does, you know, put uh, us at a, an uneasy position and so the fact that we do not accept Chalcedon at least at the time until today has a legit background to it hmm. with an emphatic yes yes yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean in, in the yeah. words of, of Christine she said very clearly something new is being said right mm -hmm. and so yeah um, with all the other things going on let, let's actually transition to Chalcedon because obviously these We're theological there. terms, yeah, they they don't Sorry. just exist in a vacuum. No, no, that's um, these are are things that happen in 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 real life and dialogue, and and sometimes councils there. Well, there's a lot of background there. So there's a couple of clips that I want us to take a quick peek at. One of them's fairly short, uh, and then we'll jump a little bit more in depth into Chalcedon. This is just kind of leading up to Chalcedon. All right, so are the Oriental Orthodox or non-Chalcedonian churches then guilty of what uh, is termed Eutychianism, that is, Christ's human nature was somehow swallowed up by his divinity? No. Okay, so you, you would not go that far there. That's good. All right, so, so very, very in, emphatically no, just for our non-Oriental Orthodox listeners today, 
uh, very clear that no the Oriental Orthodox Church does not believe in Eutychianism. All right, go ahead. Can I just uh, yeah. backtrack real quick on yeah. something? We we said we 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 mentioned before that Saint Cyril takes a lot of what he produced as material, affirming positively the content of the faith from Saint Gregory the Theologian. The flagship, <laughs> the, not the flagship, I should say the flag, um, the banner, the standard of Gregory the Theologian on anything Thomas. pertaining to the mystery of the incarnation Thomas. is is the following. What is not assumed mm. is mm. not healed, healed, healed of all the words. Yeah. Mm. My dear Father John, <laughs> Father John, what is not so. assumed is not healed. What is not assumed is not healed. If we take teachings on the incarnation as they flow through the apostles, Saint Irenaeus, Saint Athanasius, the, the Cappadocian fathers, the holy Cappadocian fathers, and as that is, is climaxed in Saint Cyril, um th th there is no th 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 this is the this is the foundational understanding of everything that is being spoken about yeah mm -hmm. the church of alexandria abandoning uh, no the church of alexandria the the the, the orth all of the orthodox the centuries worth of orthodoxy being poured into antioch and in alexandria the syrian church mm -hmm. the syrian church and the alexandrian church disregarding that or talking about anything with that being not foundational is is the epitome of absurdity mm -hmm. it's it's absolutely crazy you can go into our sunday schools and when we speak about saint gregory the theologian that's the one quote yeah we quote <laughs> it's true that's the yeah. one quote any kid from sunday school if they heard about if they got any sunday on gregory the theologian that's the one quote they come out with mm -hmm. what is not assumed is not healed Hmm. So, so how can we not speak of a full, real hum humanity? Hmm. It's hmm. All right. So let's let's slide into some of the figures, and uh, Madame Cheo does a fantastic job of breaking them down. And then I'd like to get your thoughts on on that. Eutyches, who was an archimandrite or monastic superior in the Eastern Church at Constantinople and who died around 454, that is just after the Council of Chalcedon, was condemned as a heretic, as he emphasized the exclusive prevalence of the divinity in Christ. After the Council of Chalcedon, Severus, who was the Patriarch of Antioch from 512 to 518, was condemned but the studies of today clearly show that he was just a true and good follower of Cyril of Alexandria in his Christological mm -hmm. formulation using miaphysis in the sense we explained before. Thus, we can say that he's not a monophysite, but he's a miaphysite. As for Dioscorus, Patriarch of Alexandria from 444 to 454, who also follows this Miaphysic terminology of Cyril, he was condemned for canonical reasons, for not coming to the council after being asked to do so. And he was not condemned for theological reasons. Okay. All right, so actually before we jump in, I want to show one more short clip. This one's about just under 40 seconds by Dr. Butinoff, and he because he touches on some of the same points, and then I want to get your thoughts on the difference in tone between um, Christine uh, Cheo and uh, Dr. Butinoff, uh, Butinoff about just, yeah, the, the difference in tone that you see. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, some of the leading patristic scholars we have all agree. You know, Mayendorf, Lauf, Baer, you know, Galitzin, all agree that Severus was teaching the same thing as Cyril of Alexandria. You know, so that's a new insight, I think, uh, that we do well to learn from. 
So, so what are you hearing that Christine Cheo and Dr. Butnev are saying that Father John Mahfouz is not and vice versa? Um, I think they are presenting a very clear, faithful and unbroken continuity from Cyril to those that we see as um, faithful, both heroes and fathers of the faith. When we speak of Dioscoros, when we speak of Severus, we take pride in the fact that we call them our fathers, our teachers, our patriarchs. Um, and very clearly, um, these two scholars, these two theologians, are very clearly pointing to the fact that these two find their faith founded in their forefather, who is Cyril of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Now, un unfortunately, when we contrast that to what is implied um, in Father John's short video, um, I think he makes a few grave mistakes. I don't know if it was a blunder on his part, but he says a few things actually about the history surrounding Chalcedon that are unfortunately just blatantly untrue. Um, he says, for instance, Dioscorus didn't go to the council. Oh no, he, he was very much there. He was put on trial there, only then to be put under house arrest because he was held in contempt. He was held in contempt um, because of the outcome of what happened at the so-called robber council in 449. Mm -hmm. And he was left there to hang by himself with the intention of being able to say, this is something that you have contributed to. So to say that he's not there is simply not mm -hmm. true. He was very clearly there. There was, if you, and if you read the minutes produced by uh, Father Richard Price, it is very clear that there was dialogue. He asked several times that Cyril be read and that the minutes of Ephesus be read. And so it's very clear that he was there and that he was faithful to Cyril. The other thing that I think all of this points to is another, um, another important aspect to how it is that when we speak of these people, whether it be Severus or Dioscorus, the church has constantly been producing people who have attempted as best as they possibly can to remain faithful mm -hmm. to what it is that they have received. And in light of what it is that you had said earlier, Father, you talked about how it is that the gut reaction to the church at that time, the non Chalcedonian church specifically, was to say, hold on, we're uncomfortable with this. Mm -hmm. This is not what we are used to. This is not what Ephesus was, you know, both proclaiming as well attempting to prevent harm from. Mm. Um, the other thing I think that's important to, to understand is that, you know, Father, um, Father John seems to present Chalcedon in a way where the church met, the, word, the, the church functions in council, the council made the decision, people didn't jump on board. If you don't jump on board, you got to get off the bus. And if you get off the bus, you're not part of the church. I think that is, um, unfortunately, a grave oversimplification, if not even an erroneous claim. And the reason for that is because if you take a look historically, mm. there was a lot of unrest after Chalcedon for mm. almost a hundred years. And this was on every side. Globally, in many different regions, there was constantly this move between, should we go back to you know, being non-Chalcedonian or Chalcedonian? What do we do with the formula? There was multiple attempts at reconciliation mm. so that ultimately all of this can culminate into the Fifth Ecumenical Council where things were clarified, definitions were readdressed with the attempt of being able to say, no, Chalcedon is not a victory for Nestorians, mm. but rather, this is what the church has always attempted to be able to say. Mm. I think these scholars are giving a much more precise and more accurate depiction of what was happening on the non-Chalcedonian side than the oversimplification that Father John was presenting. I want to actually use that as an opportunity to jump into something else that Dr. Butnev says as to why there were some of the misunderstandings. And there's a couple of things that he mentions that I think were very insightful, and I want your reactions on those as well. Can you give some specifics about where some of the misunderstanding may have taken place, and uh, what can we learn from that today as we continue our dialogues? Sure. Um, I think it's, it's pretty common to focus on the word nature in Greek, Thesis, uh, as as one of the sort of key areas here, you know, um, 
the word diophysite means to nature. You know, Chalcedo Chalcedonian Christians profess uh, Christ known in two natures. Um, and Miaphysite Christians, we can get into that term later, um, profess uh, a faith in Christ with one incarnate nature, one divina human nature. And so uh, a lot of the sifting out that has had to happen in, in the centuries is, uh, are these two uses of nature uh, both acceptable? Now, the Fifth Ecumenical Council actually says, yes, both terms are acceptable. The one incarnate nature is acceptable and the two natures is acceptable. Our own ecumenical council says that. We often forget the fifth ecumenical council because we're so obsessed by the fourth. But um, so, you know, it, but it's a matter of, of finding the implications of what the fifth ecumenical council meant when it said that you could use both these terms. And if it said that, why, why didn't it kind of seal the deal right then and there in the sixth century? It didn't. And that's partly because uh, by that time, the, the political uh, and ecclesiastical divisions were so sharp and clouded by persecutions and, 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 and other things. But um, the more we look into that term, what it meant even to post-Chalcedonian uh, theologians like Severus, whom the non-Chalcedonians venerate as a saint, and whom the Eastern Orthodox, uh, in some contexts, anathematize. Well, what did he mean by thesis? That's an entirely different question. And uh, once we decide, once we care enough to drill deeper into what he actually meant, then, you know, some of the leading patristic scholars we have all agree. You know, Mayendorf, Lauf, Baer, you know, Galitzin, all agree that Severus was teaching the same thing as Cyril of Alexandria. You know, so that's a new insight, I think, uh, that we do well to learn from. All right. So he gives some explanation of misunderstandings and perhaps some new insights. Uh, any thoughts on that? Anyone would like to chime in? Earlier, Father, you mentioned uh, what do you hear as different between Dr. Peter, Dr. Butnev, and Madame Chaillot uh, vis a vis uh, versus Father John? Um, would could I could I could I tell you more about um, um, what I see as opposed to what I hear? Yeah, I see um, two people in Doctor Butnev and Madame Chaillot, Christine Chaillot, um, that before making an opinion, before before um, allowing themselves to um, to say something about someone, they take the time to, you know, this is the old story. I think it's Aristotle. Tempted to say Aristotle. It's either Aristotle or Plato. That uh, a friend, uh, a friend of Aristotle came to him and says, hey, about our friend, this and this and this and this and that. He's talking to them about another common friend of theirs. There are three, three. Hmm. And uh, so Aristotle starts listening, says, yep. And he puts his hand on one ear. Hmm. And at the end, you know, halfway through, he's distracted. The person who's coming up to him and talk to him about their third friends and who's in there. He goes, what are you doing? He goes, take your hand off your ear. It's distracting. He says, I'm, I'm saving it for my uh, for our other friend. Mm -hmm. I'm saving it for our other friend. <laughs> you know? So, um, the, let the other party, let the other person, let the other, let the other mm. say what they have to say. And in the persons of Dr. Butnev and Christine Chaillot, they went to the the furthest they could in terms of people who can speak mm. for the communion, mm -hmm. people from the experts from the Armenian Church, from the Syriac Church, from the Coptic Church, from the Ethiopians, from the Eritreans, from the Indian Communion, mm. who 
are researched, trained theologically, equipped in order to be able to read these fathers, compare texts, and actually speak to the subject, not speak to impressions. You'll forgive me. I don't mean to be uncharitable. Mm. But to say that I, 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 I stop seeing, to imply that I stop believing the lie, that there is something worth exploring in terms of dialogue, mm. or that there is something we could learn from each other, because and I'm taking nothing away from the experience of Father John when I say this. Mm -hmm. I do be I, I believe his 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 experience was genuine, mm -hmm. and that it's the first time that somebody actually speaks to him about the love of Jesus in that way, speaks to him about the Jesus prayer in that way, speaks to him about these things and how they influence the reading of Scripture and fasting and the ascetical life and the liturgical life in the church. Sure, mm -hmm. um, but to, to to say that to say that. Um, uh, because I, be, be, because I tasted the Jesus prayer, and somebody talked to me about the love of Christ, that there's um, nothing else worth exploring in the other side, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to let them tell me. Uh, well, the fathers of the, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, concil historically, the fathers, you know. As they were led by the Holy Spirit in council, mm. right? Uh, was it always all the fathers who are articulating the faith? Mm. Or are there certain members mm. in the body of Christ who are chosen to be the mm. mouthpieces of the church? And they're very, very few in every era in which an articulation of the faith needs to be uh, made, mm. you know, in which the faith needs to be articulated precisely. Right? Not everybody was Athanasius. Not everybody was St. John Chrysostom. Not everybody was Gregory the Theologian or Basil the Great. Mm. And certainly not everybody was Cyril. You know, Christine Cheo <laughs> mentioned to look in a liturgical text, right? If you want to know what do people believe, look at their worship, look at their liturgy. And I remember Bishop Daniel uh, Findikian, before he was, when he was, before he was a bishop, he was. Um, serving at a, the Armenian seminary in New York, and he came to give us a liturgical theology course at the Coptic Seminary in New Jersey. And he said the same exact phrase, if you want to know what a people believe, look at their worship, mm -hmm. open their worship books. Yes. And more recently, I was at the Antiochian village during a residential week and had the pleasure of meeting a very, I believe, holy and, and pious man, Metropolitan Saba. And um, he was sharing a story with a number of the uh, MTH students in the cohort, because there were also a few Copts that were were present. And uh, I was I was there and observing this and and he said, you know, that he was one time at um, at a at a liturgy in Wedina Trun when he was still a monk. This was several decades ago. Where is Wedina Trun for those? Oh, who sorry. Know? He was at Saint Beshoy Monastery in Wedina Trun in Egypt. Yeah. it's uh, the Skitis where there's a number, a cluster of monasteries, uh, where in some ways the 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 birth of monasticism uh, or the creative of monasticism in the deserts of Egypt. Uh, came about. So he he was at a liturgy there, and he was standing next to a Coptic Orthodox monk. And when they came to the fraction, and he said, "Father, pull it up, pull it up," and he made me read it. it says, and I'm just going to read. It. He says, "This is the life giving flesh, which your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, took from our Lady, the Lady of us all, the Holy Theotokos Saint Mary. He made it one with His divinity, without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration." And he said he was standing next to one of the monks and he started elbowing him and he said, wait, that's what we say, <laughs> right? That's at, you know, um, at one of our councils. And the monk said, we'll talk later, you know. <laughs> um, but if you want to know what a people believe, look at their worship, look at their liturgical yeah. texts. Don't tell us what we believe. Ask us and listen to us and look at what it is that we say 
that we believe. Or stand next to us and pray with us, and you'll see for yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The old. Uh, but you, you first have to, to to care. What I like about Doctor Peter Peter Doctor Peter, I'm a big fan, by the way. Doctor Peter Butenev cares. You can see it mm. in his tone of voice, right? Mm. And if you have the humility, and if you have confidence in your own faith. You will not be afraid of looking at the other and trying mm. to discover what is it that they're believing and to communicate with them. And even if you disagree, even if they don't hold the same faith, if we're talking about but other people, maybe, maybe even non-Christians, at least you have it in your heart as a Christian to love them. Your heart has mm. always to be open for them. If you don't have that basic feeling as a human towards the other, then you're not living your Christianity. Mm. And if you're not living a Christian, so what's the point of claiming orthodoxy when I'm not even doing the basics of Christianity? I'm not perfect. I, I try to love my enemy, right? But this is something that we were always seeking. So I find it very scary, actually, mm. when people claim orthodoxy, yet the basics of Christianity are not shown in their lives. Yeah, the basic evangelical mm, tenets. Yeah. Mm. You know, That's scary stuff. Mm. Yeah. yeah and in, in some ways this is there's been a beautiful dialogue that has been taking place but challenges remain mm -hmm. and i think this is one of the underlying themes that exists that prevents or challenges a continued dialogue uh, and movement yeah. of these two beautiful sisters or mothers towards one another yes mm. and, and father to be clear for the sake of complete transparency, um, if we go back to your example, some of those two beautiful mother's children on both sides mm. are speaking and behaving in ways where they are making reconciliation between the two families virtually impossible because of their outlook. Mm. But there are others, and I see it very beautifully, that spirit of a desire of union and reconciliation. You see it in Dr. Butanev. You see it in um, Christine Chaillot, we, we see it in many others, we see it in Metropolitan Saba, um, but there are others who in the way that they speak and the worldview that they have adopted and the perspective of the other on both sides where they are making it impossible mm. for the Holy Spirit to work. And I think for that minority, and I'm, I'm hoping in my heart of hearts that, that it truly is a minority of people, that that minority would at the very least turn to prayer, allow for dialogue, and let those who have consecrated a very large portion of their life in trying to know the other for the sake of being able to fulfill Christ's ultimate desire as expressed in mm. John 17, that they all may be one just as we are one. Mm. At least let those people uh, lead the conversation. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the challenges. Let's queue up the next clip and talk about some of the challenges towards that reconciliation because uh, nobody enjoys schism and disunion and ecclesiastical battles. Uh, if you do enjoy them, you might have a problem. <laughs> Some people uh, have a problem. You know, it's, it's, it's a time of, of that sometimes the dust needs to settle, and sometimes the dust needs a thousand years <laughs> to settle. And, uh, you know, I think already there was a hunch back then that, that the, the word nature, feces, was being used in different ways. Uh, but some of the other repercussions about who gets anathematized, you know, who gets to be a saint, um, th these questions sometimes got clouded in the political turbulence. And I think we have a, a clearer perspective on some of them. Again, not smarter, just perspective. Great. So what are some of the obstacles that you all see that remain to reconciliation? I know you mentioned uh, some of the the undertone that exists from some um, cousins, perhaps, if you will, in faith, uh, children of these two moms, right? How they respond to one another. Maybe not just the outlook, but the tone. But what are some other challenges, perhaps, that, that remain towards moving to reconciliation? And this is by no means comprehensive. I'm just going to shoot one out sure. there. I think uh, Dr. Dr. Butnev, um, uh, very plainly implied 
Um, the fact that because we've been separated for so long, mm-hmm. because we've been apart for so long, there's been the development of traditions from both sides mm-hmm. on who are saints yeah. mm-hmm. and who are leaders of heresy, originators and leaders yeah. in in heresy. And uh, I'll just name that one as mm. in no particular order right. an obstacle. And so what do you do with those people? Right? What do you do with and 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 he does mention some of that, but we'll we'll talk about that in maybe a few minutes. But what do you do with Pope Leo if you're Oriental Orthodox or what do you do with Severus and Dioscorus if you're Eastern Orthodox? How yeah. do you how do you deal with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, anathematizing someone does not have to last forever. Mm. The church has the authority to remove the anathema for the other. Mm. So I mean if there is discussion and I realize that Dioscorus is not a heretic, right? If Severus is not a heretic, I've discovered mm. this. Can't the Eastern Orthodox Church have the authority to remove the anathema? One would presume so. Yeah, of yeah. course they do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, if the Holy Spirit is present in the church and they do have the authority to do this, same thing from the Oriental side, right? So removing, uh, I, I think one, one point that is, so you don't have to declare them as saints in your own church. Mm. Uh, if you want to avoid, you know, looking erroneous in the past, and, and that's fine. But you can at least remove the anathema allow the other side to declare them as a saint and that's fine this is what we Mm. do all the time between the different churches and we're very okay with it there is a diversity that is there i think that's very easily done if people uh, are willing to do it theodore of mobsuestia in 451 at chalcedon was declared orthodox his writings were declared orthodox and the church the church in 553 uh said that as soon as we read the writings thereof immediately the mm. their their impiety was made manifest mm. and so just as it has the authority to mm. to bind it also mm. has the authority to mm. loosen but the issue there that arises is what are the ramifications mm. if uh, a group decides to come together what happens to are there chances that other groups are separated off what do you mean um well will everybody from both sides agree just mm-hmm. because the hierarchy for a certain hierarchy or a certain group from the hierarchy mm-hmm. from from both sides agreed um on a some form yeah. of reconciliation and whatever that entails. Mm-hmm. And to be clear, historically, when we spoke about that period where there was a tremendous amount of dialogue, and uh, Christine Chaillot very clearly hinted at this when she talked about the unofficial and the official dialogues that happened in Switzerland, mm-hmm. uh, one of the outcomes of that is that all 14 members of the families signed and agreed. Yeah. And one of the statements that came out of that was we now recognize that while expressing it very differently, we share the same Christological belief, mm-hmm. And it was upheld as faithful as we both could for the longest period of time. And when it got back to some of the members of those different churches, there was a variety of different reactions. Not everyone agreed. And I think that is another big challenge that will face us. Hmm. Uh, And to Father's point, when you talked about, for instance, Theodore uh, and how it is that he was received at Chalcedon and officially anathematized in Second Constantinople 100 years later, the non Chalcedonians would say, well, he was excommunicated by us in 449. Uh, and even though he was excommunicated at that council that was led, um, one of its leaders, one of its presiders was Dioscorus, even though he was anathematized much before the rest of the church came along and excommunicated him, that difference in period shouldn't have to matter. The the church can Mm. adapt and come to realization that the Holy Spirit is constantly working, revealing things to us. And if we desire union, we have to allow ourselves to struggle with very difficult things. And despite the reactions we might see, despite the fact that sometimes on things that don't matter, we may have to sit down and say, you know what, we can agree to disagree as to how we understand the history. But what's most important is what do we do with what we know today? Mm. Because historically, if you ask, and I think even Father John 
um, in his video, he alluded to this. He said the non-Castledonians are not going to back down and suddenly accept Chalcedon. Mm. And we are not going to drop Chalcedon. So there's no hope. Well, I don't know if it's that simple. I, I really do think there is a possibility for us to, to for the non-Castledonians to sit down to say in light of what was said yeah. in Second Constantinople, can we understand where the church, the Eastern Orthodox Church is today? And I think the Eastern Orthodox Church, in light of Second Chalcedon, can also sit down and say, can we also have an appreciation for where the non-Chalcedonians were when they originally rejected what was being happening or what was being spoken and expressed in Chalcedon? It's what we want for today. Will we always agree on what happened in history? Not necessarily. And I know I'm oversimplifying it. I'm very happy that this decision is way above my pay grade and that ultimately uh, what I am called to do as a presbyter in uh, the non-Chalcedonian church and the Coptic Orthodox church um, is to go to the altar every single liturgy and to pray that the Holy Spirit may continue to work to make us one body and one spirit. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then I don't think there's an obstacle that's too big for God to be able to overcome. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Mm. There's another challenge towards reconciliation that I want to turn to. We're going to jump into a, a video here. In America, you have pockets of places where there is a, a very close collaboration, um, it, where where our churches are often side by side with each other in some localities. Uh, in the blessing, uh, as I was saying, at St. Vladimir Seminary, where a large percentage of our students are uh, Oriental Orthodox, Coptic, and Armenian especially, uh, you know, the the... Again, the, I keep using that word impulse. The impulse is to um, be together in as in as as much as it's possible. Um, we are not uh, in formal communion with each other, and therefore, uh, at our seminary, which is obviously a very visible and an important place, uh, we're not allowed to. We we do not share intercommunion, um, uh, and. It, you know, when we are at liturgy and the Malankara and Coptic and other stu students and Armenian students are standing in the back and not receiving communion, it's an extremely painful thing. Should be. And yeah, exactly, John. It should be painful. We need to be familiar with that pain uh, because that pain needs to uh, motivate our, our, our action. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think one of the reason I wanted to play this clip is I, I think one of the challenges is that I think in, in American culture, we avoid discomfort. We flee from it. We like our comfortable our, our comfort in general. Preach. Yeah. And so hmm. so so I think one of the other things that Dr. Butnef mentions is that the relationship between the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox, in the Middle East, in Egypt, or in the mother country, as he, he he calls it, says are in many ways they're they're closer because um, assuming that they're living side by side, right? He says because Christianity has been a small minority um, and factions cannot be afforded. And then the the second thing that he says is because the relationships tend to be closer. And they live together, they break bread together, they intermarry quite a bit in some of these places. There's a pastoral approach that does not ignore theology. And so, what do you make of the sense that in our comfort here, it's easy for us to sit in our, you know, high churches and kind of look out and say, we're, we're, we're comfortable where we're at. Mm. And sometimes it's discomfort moves us and, and we have to be able to look at the other and see them kind of as the video is describing that there is a pain that's there when we look and we see our brother, our sister, not being able to commune with us. In the same joy. Yes. What do you make of that? I think you said it. I think that's one of the main reasons why we're not working together towards unity. I think I think it could be in the hierarchs of the church they are afraid of the minority that is always loud that is does not like or that claims that the others are non-orthodox mm. right and and if, as a hierarch 
in the church, I'm not ready to be crucified with Christ. If I'm not ready to, to hold on to the truth and seeking the other in love for the sake of my own comfort, it could become a problem. Um, so I definitely agree that that comfort as a whole, it just it is what it is. We've been used to this, you know. We we we're doing our own thing. Um, is definitely a problem. Um, and that's what I like about Dr. Peter Butenev so much. Like you can see the zeal mm. and, and his broken heart, and, and that is something that is ultimately wrong in the body of Christ, and it must be healed. Mm. And he's not a clergy member, but his care is so obvious for everyone to see, mm. regardless of any kind of ramification he might get from these type of videos, regardless of us using his videos to describe, you know, how we should be going towards each other. But this is what Christianity is all about. If we want to find resurrection, we carry it across. Like one of the Desert Fathers, I mean, this is more of a tangent, but he says this beautiful thing or this beautiful saying that is very hard to bear. I think I shared it before, but he says, if you want to be like Christ or have the new man renewed within you, keep away anything that keeps you from going down from the cross. So, so the implication is that you are being crucified as a Christian, that, that's, that's the, the standard. Hmm. So avoiding comfort is an absolute necessity if we want all of us together to work towards that unity because comfort definitely keeps away, even in terms of marriage. Right, marriage is difficult. Marriage is an arena, right, where I'm I'm dealing with this other person who has grown in a different household with different habits, and all of a sudden, like I, I'm living with that person twenty four seven. Okay, so is that comfortable? Mm. It's not. The first year is always very difficult, but this is what Christianity is about, and we learn to love through that discomfort. So uh, it's, it's definitely a challenge. I agree, it's uh, not a but it's not all. a good reason for us to keep away from each other and it's not a good reason to, to not communicate with each other. Mm. I'd like to highlight something <laughs> in uh, reference to what Father John um, Mahfouz said when he said, oh yeah, the Coptic priest would tell me, oh yeah, come have communion, we're all the same. This is not what's happening at St. Vladimir's Chapel. Mm -hmm. The Armenians the Malankara, the Copts, are all staying back at mm. the time of the distribution of the mysteries. Mm. There's a, there's, there's, yeah, we're we're studying together. Mm. We can go to prayer together, you know, maybe during the hours, during uh, Akathis or mm. whatever it is they can do together. But there's a painful reminder there. Mm. There's an observance. There is a desire for unity mm. that we share with Christ, but not at the expense of, um, uh, how can you say, wrongly accelerated, um, shoved under the carpet mm. uh, uh, arguments, <laughs> you know, that kind of way of doing something not, um, un un not truly, not, mm. not, not, not thoroughly, as befits mm. the love as befits Christian love. Mm -hmm. There's a clip that I want us to turn to that is a little uncomfortable, but I'd like us to Speaking of which. play it and, um, and share reflections and thoughts as to how this also contributes to the challenge of moving forward, just this sort of a tone. I feel... And I firmly believe that coming to the truth actually honors most my Egyptian background because it comes back to its fullness. And I, I believe that anyone who leaves their, um, leaves what is broken and, and distorted to enter into the fullness actually fulfills with great honor their ancestors. How does it honor our ancestors to, re to remain in darkness, to not move towards what their hearts yearned for and desired 
maybe in, in ignorance, not knowing, or maybe because of, um, um, you know, their own um, wounds and, and, and blindness. This is a struggle sometimes for certain catechumens coming from, very, especially ethnic backgrounds, uh, various ethnicities who have strong familial ties to certain churches. Um, I experienced this a lot when I was in Salt Lake City. I, I served in Salt Lake City for a few years as an assistant there. And this is a very difficult thing for Mormons. But I mean, really, <laughs> Egyptian Coptics who I've received uh, many over the years into the Orthodox Church and, and you know, Mexicans and, 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 and Guatemalans and others who are, you know, leaving their Catholic backgrounds and struggle with how their families are re reacting, responding to, to this move of theirs. But ultimately, they're, they're honoring to the highest degree their ancestors by, for them, for them going to what's higher and therefore being as we pray for departed loved ones, a more powerful, offering a more powerful prayer for them as we do in the, you know, as we pray for our loved ones as Orthodox Christians. Ay, ay, ay. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Cops are being compared to Mormons ay, ay, ay. in terms of the, the female, the familiar, the familiar. Mm. The leaving, the, the painfulness of, uh, the painful uh, leaving of the familiarity. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. This is so out of touch with reality. Hmm. So out of touch with reality. And it's really painful to hear, honestly. Hmm. Um, and again, where where is the meat? Where is the information? Where is the evidence? What What are we talking about? what is the fullness that is lacking in the Orient Orthodox Church? Um, and I'd rather not speak on this one. Can I jump in for a second? Yeah. I, I have, um, if you'll allow me, I have, I want to give two very clear messages. The first one is to all of our Oriental brothers and sisters and our children in the Oriental Church. I want this to be very, very clear. As long as you have the life-giving Holy Spirit that was granted to you at the moment of your baptism and your chrismation, you are not blind. You have access to be able to see just as much of all of the holy men and women who came before us. You are called to be a saint and you have the capacity to be a saint. You are not broken because you are in the Oriental Church. On the contrary, the only thing that breaks us is our sin. And the Church, the Lord has given her the capacity through the Holy Mysteries to be able to help you, to heal you, to renew you. And this grace is found in the Oriental Orthodox Church. If you are a person who feels like maybe you haven't surrendered to the truth, it is not because you are in the Oriental Church, but possibly because maybe you have believed a lie. And so for all of those who are listening who are from the Oriental families, everything that Father John has just presented does not in any way, shape, or form apply to you. Mm. And my message to my dear brother, in the priesthood, which I recognize in the Eastern Church, Father John Mahfouz, you are harming the body of Christ, whom you love so dearly. The one that you were called to serve faithfully, you are harming. Inadvertently, possibly, unintentionally, possibly, but you do harm to the body of Christ when you speak in this way. And to suggest that the best way for Oriental Orthodox Christians to be able to honor their ancestry is to leave the darkness and come to the light, to leave the death that they have in their church and to come to life. I can understand if that is spoken to people who are unbelieving, people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvific gospel. But to speak this to your brothers and sisters who are in the Oriental Church, forgive me, but you are causing harm to the church. And I would encourage everyone to ignore that clip because it only it only poses pain and harm. In preparing for this podcast, I considered pulling different quotes from different Oriental Orthodox scholars and theologians and 
And I, I felt it was important to also present Dr. Butenev and Christine Cheo because I, I believe it's very clear that uh, this is not the universal teaching of the Eastern Orthodox. And uh, it is quite disappointing uh, that such a tone was taken. And I think it's, um, I hope just a moment of weakness. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but no, I, I appreciate what you're saying, how you said it. Um, and I also recognize it's saddening to hear such a, a statement. And also, like for myself, yes, it's it's disappointing, but I also know for others that it could do serious harm to them. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to be thoughtful about and careful about the words that we use, as Dr. Butnif had suggested earlier. I want us just in this last segment to turn towards the path forward, because we've been speaking about some of the, the differences We've spoken about terminology, where that terminology comes from, couched in history, and then some of the challenges. But there is a path forward, and there are many people that have been working for, for decades uh, and praying through the centuries before the altar for a path forward. I want us to turn to a, a short 30-second clip from Dr. Butnif and get some initial thoughts on this. I think it's, it's, it's a question of uh, outlook and perspective. And I, I, finally on this, John, I would say um, once one is committed to genuinely exploring this, once one is committed to the possibility of enlarging the tent <laughs> of who we consider to be uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ in communion. Uh, once that becomes the goal, uh, many of the obstacles uh, become less thorny, less dire. Mm. Yeah. Once one is committed to enlarging the tent, right? Beautiful. There's a sense of being at home with one another and not sacrificing what we believe, our theology, right? The truth but really reaching out in love and seeking to see the other and hear the other. Mm. Yep. Um, I, I do want to jump a, a little bit ahead and um, because Dr. Butnef also, he mentions the idea of how the fathers changed their opinion. And you kind of, mm. both of you alluded to that. Uh, and so let's look at that because I think this is, potentially a controversial topic for some, but let's see what he says and, and get some reflections as to how this could also be considered when we look for a path forward. I teach at St. Vladimir's Seminary, as you mentioned, I've taught there 23 years. And uh, one of the blessings of our seminary is that we have students from both church families uh, very fully integrated into the student life and into the whole theological life of the school. And I've taught a seminar a couple of times on the coming together of our churches. And uh, the question comes up, and it's a very reasonable question. And the question is, uh, are we smarter than the fathers? Do we think that we know better than the fathers who anathematized the monophysites uh, back in the day? Uh, who do we think we are? So as I say, it's not an unreasonable question, but I think my book is is an attempt to um, explore that question. And you know, the outset, of course, we're not smarter, we're not wiser, we're not more spiritual than the fathers, we're not more loving than the fathers. All we had to do was love each other, um, but we have more information. And uh, what uh, you know, I've kind of pretty far along in the book right now. And what it, I seem to be finding is that um, what we're doing with the modern dialogue is something that is very patristic. And that is, you know, when new information comes to light, when conversations happen about what did you mean by that term, the fathers reconsider 
their judgments. Uh, this happens in the fourth century. St. Athanasius asks uh, people what they mean by hypostasis, what they mean by usia, and he changes his mind about their church status on the basis of their answers to that question. Um, the Cappadocians are, are, are so keen on this mutual understanding, like genuine understanding, not just a war of slogans and terms. Um, and then, uh, you know, another example, uh, fathers who were received or bishops who were received at the Fourth Ecumenical Council, their writings were anathematized in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. You know, so uh, even at ecumenical councils, fathers uh, reconsider on the basis of new perspectives and new information. And so what I hope that we're doing in the modern dialogue process is uh, finding that patristic mind that we're always talking about, you know, being patristic a, a, as much as we can, affiliating ourselves with the fathers. Um, so that's what the book is aiming to show, like by looking back at that period of the ecumenical councils and um, what went on. So let me flip the script on you. Sure. You just heard this. Yep. What What would you have to say in response to this? Or what are your comments facing this? It's easy to make a lot of opinions about the other when you haven't been in dialogue with the other, right? For even if it's just for weeks. I mean, think about when a husband and wife are in conflict with one another or two clergy members or two members of the parish may be in conflict with one another for, for days or weeks or months. And the amount of narrative that goes into, well, he said, she said, he did, no, he did, um, and how much it's important to actually sit down. And, and oftentimes when people come for, you know, to, to, to complain about someone, um, I always tell people, I'm like, I'm, I'm hearing you, but I, I know there's three sides of the story. There's your side, the other person's side, and the truth somewhere in the middle, right? And, and so I think what, what Dr. Butnif is, is getting at is that as new information becomes available, as we look at this info that has come up, and he's speaking specifically as an Eastern Orthodox scholar and theologian and professor at St. Vladimir's for decades and working on this research on this subject, he's saying, hey, there's new information that we have kind of unearthed. And uh, and it's telling us a lot about the other person mm -hmm. and that 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 other that other mother, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, and maybe we've misunderstood her, and maybe she's been misrepresented mm -hmm. in our books, in our articles, in some of our classes that we've taught that has kind of been passed on traditionally, yeah. you know, from uh, from one generation to the next. It, it, it sometimes happens between people of different races or classes where, you know, there's there's distrust that that comes up yeah. between people. And and so so I think, you know, one of the, the paths forward or one of the ways that there can be a path forward is that there would be a willingness to to actually take this new information and not to ignore who we are, but to be able to acknowledge who the other is. Yeah. Right, and to say, is there, is there a path forward towards reconciliation, just like we would in a marriage counseling session? Right, um, I think that we would do. Hopefully, if there's conflict within a parish, and obviously on a on a much higher level and a much larger level, um, with our two families. So if we want to actually imitate the fathers, if we go back into the centuries, how did the fathers live? Did they did not communicate with each other? Was there not communication between Cyril and Nestorius? And it kept on going back and forth. What happened between you know, the fourth council, the fifth council, even, even in 449, 431, leading to 451, was there not communication? Was there not um, decisions that were reversed? People anathematize people like removed from that list of anathema. So, if we want to imitate the fathers, it's clear that communication is an absolute must, 
in humility, really seeking unity, and they took it. They not take. They did not take that unity for granted. They cared about that unity of the church. This is how the church fathers looked at the church, and they went through this entire effort to make sure the unity is kept. What are the councils about? I mean, these people did not have helicopters and airplanes to 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 go and meet each other in the councils. They traveled for days for what sake? For proper communication, proper decision led by the Holy Spirit. This is how the church fathers did things. Mm. So if you want to adopt, we're not better than the fathers. We are we are um, taking their actual approach if we look forward into communicating with each other, seeking that unity. Mm. I'd like to take a particular angle to this. Uh, my, uh, my Old Testament teacher, Father Cyprian Hutchin, who is uh, a priest in the OCA, a man to whom I will be always eternally and infinitely indebted. Um, once I was speaking, I was saying the non-Chalcedonians, this and that, and he says, stop saying non-Chalcedonians, please. It makes it sound like you're missing something. You know, and since that day, <laughs> you know, to speak yourself as a non-something, you know, it's, it's, you know, Nobody walks around saying I'm a non this or non that, you know. Mm. Well, well, anyway, <laughs> without going too deep into that, without going much further into that, you know, when fa when when Doctor Peter Butnev was um, was talking about how Saint Athanasius in the fourth century, uh, he 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 would give a chance to clarify, or he would collect more information about something. Sorry about that. Co collect more information. Or what do you mean by that to a certain group? And when they would clarify what they meant by hypostasis or osia, mm. hypoxis or whatever, he would uh, uh, he would then and then he then he would change his mind about uh, mm. about the situation, come to a different conclusion. The 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 ability to do so, to change his mind about the situation, and to, to say, oh no, then they are good there, or this is unacceptable, or this is truth. Is that he had a certain disposition? Uh, uh, yeah, he had he had the, mm. the knowledge mm. to be able to do so. Mm. Right? Is that he knew what is and could speak to what is orthos, what is straight and good, and right, um, in a statement, um, no matter the language, because of the clarifications of the definitions, mm. of the meaning, of the application of certain words in certain contexts. So I think it's important for us moving forward to really dig deep into our own tradition, yeah. to really find out what exactly it is we're saying, and not to superficially look this up, yeah. but mm. to delve deep. Uh, Blessed Father Victor was uh, reminded us to, uh, uh, who isn't on screen with us here, um, uh, he, he took the time to very beautifully remind us that we have a tradition called the Witness of the Fathers. Mm -hmm. And this is a collection, this is an anthology, floor legend, if you will, of, um, of, of different quotes, this is an S excerpts from the Fathers, from as far as back as we can go, up to and including St. Severus of Antioch, that speak about this one fisin, this one fisin in Christ. Mm. Right? This one rea concrete reality, mm -hmm. the word "fisin," mm -hmm. as as really defined in the Alexander tradition as you know, um, this this concrete reality that Christ is one concrete reality that the divine Word, born of the Father before all ages, is the ultimate subject of all of the human experiences in the incarnation in this great ineffable, unexpressible mystery that is the uncreated becoming created, emptying himself, becoming human, mm. and mm. thereby saving us, assuming all that what all of that which needs healing and healing it in his person mm. Mm. and allowing us communion with him and his Father and the Holy Spirit. Um, and how the Fathers express this and why it is in the fifth century, we took the stance saying, no, we cannot say yes to Chalcedon. 
like this because of this and this and that and because of the circumstances that surrounded it and because of the other councils that were happening there's the council of toledo in 447 with things that were said there which we have problems i mean of course we don't have to go into these details now we won't but there is there is uh, 448 there's something that happened in constantinople there is uh, there are writings that were in circulation that we could not agree with mm -hmm. and uh, bringing all of this together yeah. The lies and the false accusations that were posed against 449, everything that led up to Chalcedon, your, your point is extremely valid. And then you push that into 102 years after that, up, you know, leading up to uh, Emperor Justinian holding a second council in Constantinople and the, and the things that were said there, notwithstanding <laughs> the sixth council, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, after that, which brought us to a different place. Um, all, all of this being brought together, it's, it's worthy of your time to study. Yeah. It's edifying yeah. to know why it is we held, and um, we, we held a certain stance towards that. And if you can see why it is you believe, why, what it is you believe, and how it is you express it, and then you can dialogue mm -hmm. with people who have done the same effort from their end. But to, to reduce it to personal experience of how it is you grew up with a certain group of Copts. And that confused you about where the lines are and where the boundaries are and where the church is and where the church isn't. And then for you to find the solution from someone from who who doesn't necessarily, who, who, cert who most certainly is not an expert on Christology. Mm. The person might be very devout to a certain tradition within, to a tradition within their church. and might be very good at repeating what a lot of people they consider fathers said in their tradition. It does not mean that they have sat down with the material and discussed it and asked it for it to be mm. clarified prayerfully and ascetically, mm. asking God to illumine the way as they do so. Just some thoughts. Thank you. In, in light of the question you were posing, Father Michael, um, a way forward, I completely agree with my fathers. The, we absolutely need the wisdom um, of the Patristic Fathers. And the same Holy Spirit that led the Patristic Fathers before us is very much at work and very much alive mm. in the church today. And our faithfulness is towards, and forgive me, I know this might come across as very crude and I don't mean it that way at all, but our faithfulness is towards the Holy Spirit, who is the very life of what it means for us to believe in holy tradition. The holy tradition mm. to us is the very life of the Holy Spirit working actively in the church. But we don't only need the wisdom of the Fathers, I think we need the courage of um, I think we need the courage of the apostles. I love the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, the apostles were pushed to do things that they would have never imagined God to push them to do. Yeah. When Peter is told in a vision, arise, Peter, kill and eat, only to realize that the Lord was sending him to the Gentiles. This blew his mind. Mm -hmm. And here he was dealing with people that he never thought. That the word reconciliation and the Gentiles were probably two things that he never necessarily thought were actually going to become a reality. Fast forward a little bit later, and the great enemy of Christianity, Paul of Tarsus, is told, go present yourself to the apostles. And the apostles are told, mm -hmm. work with him, listen to him. I have spoken to him. And here we are giving examples of an enemy of the church who is Saul of Tarsus and, and, and the Gentiles. And that's not even the categories that exist between us and our brothers and sisters or our distant cousins, mm -hmm. as you beautifully said in that image of two mothers. That's not even the reality between us. Mm -hmm. There is so much to work for. I think we need that courage of the apostles. I think we need the wisdom of the fathers. And I think we need to be faithful to whatever the Holy Spirit guides us to do. Mm -hmm. Well said. You know, that there are those who would say and look at the other and say they're in deviation. And um, they need to turn back and acknowledge that and, and repent and come home. And I'm, I'm reminded of, of something that my patristics 
teacher, Father Athanasius Farok, had said many years ago, he was sharing with us um, during one of, I believe, St. Athanasius's third return from exile. And when he comes out of exile, he there's the homo homoi usios controversy and and he shared with us really a beautiful insight where he said you know like he gathered the groups together and said before we debate over a word what is it we're saying right mm, yeah. let's figure out what it is that we're saying let's listen mm. first and then get some definition yeah let, let, let's get there first and, and i think what dr Peter Butneff and Christine Shello have shown us is that there are those who have done that. Mm -hmm. um, there are those who have sat down and looked at Christological definitions and said, what is it that we're actually saying? Yeah. And I don't think we should brush Christology under the, the rug because Christology matters. It tells us not only who Christ is, but it speaks a lot about our understanding of soteriology. Mm -hmm of what it is he has done for us certainly right what why it matters to us and i think both athanasian and cerulean christology really um, the two are are so intertwined christology and soteriology but what is it that we believe and then you know we discuss words and definitions and terms and i think when we're so fixated in the reverse that Oftentimes, right, we're focused on who's right um, and proving who's right. The the just because of time, I, I do want to point out um, a few things that Dr. Butnev had mentioned. He also said, you know, the, the the work of moving towards one another should not be done haphazardly, right? There should be a sense of are we prepared to lift anathemas? Perhaps not to acknowledge the other as a saint, but at least say, hey, we can, and I think you mentioned that as well, we can lift anathemas. And, and I think um, that that was one practical advice that he gave. But Christine Chaillot had also mentioned, I thought, a few interesting points on a path forward. Uh, she suggested that, I think, something very practical for the laity get to know your brothers and sisters or your cousins, right? She asked a question. She said, how many of you know the Oriental Orthodox priest or parish or laity in, in, your, in your town, in your mm. city? Mm. You know, talk to the, their bishop. What I didn't hear her say was, go, go visit there and make it your home, right? Because she is acknowledging still that pain that exists, that there's not a a union that allows us just to hop back and forth. But what I heard her say was, go get to know them, yeah. befriend them, treat them like brothers and sisters. And I think the same goes from our side. There needs to be a willingness to say, hey, who are those people over there? And it requires a sense of confidence in who we are. Yeah. And so, yes, we need to know our, our faith, yeah, our Christology, yep. But we need to not fear being in dialogue with the other. Mm -hmm. That any thoughts on that? You looked like you wanted to jump in. No, no, okay, no. But with fear and trembling, move forward. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I want to close this out here because I, I think this has been a uh, thoroughly enjoyable, challenging at times, but an enjoyable. Uh, There's an incline. Podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, I think. You know, one of the things that, that I was reminded of is, yes, Christology matters. Uh, yeah. This is not, the church was not just being difficult or uh, meticulous just for the sake of, you know, uh, appearing pious or whatever. No, like these things matter, uh, who he is, because he is the truth. And that truth, being a person, sets us free yes. uh, through our union um, with him and him bridging the gap and uniting himself to us. Amen. What we've done here has been like a really, I think, healthy discussion yeah. amongst friends, amongst brothers, um, fairly informal. Yeah. And I think, you know, 
we did not approach this in a in a hyper academic way. Um, there's a, a lot that could have been said that we didn't say, um, but we just so at least wanted to provide a loving uh, response to a video that that we felt caused a little bit of pain and quite a bit of misunderstanding uh, for some of the children of the Oriental Orthodox Church, as well as our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox Church. We, we, we do hope that these sorts of conversations can continue, both formally and informally, but that, of course, is uh, beyond the scope of this podcast. Uh, we do pray for um, proper understanding of the other and uh, that the Lord would lead uh, these brothers and sisters or cousins closer to one another so that our, our moms who are sisters uh, might give a beautiful reflection of the unity of God with his church here on earth. I would just encourage you, get to know your aunt because she is a beautiful woman. And uh, as you get to know her, you might see and be inspired and encouraged by some of her children who are saints living amongst you. God bless you.